Don't you just love the times when communication in families looks just like this? You're a happy family at a sunset. Everybody's participating in the picture, making things go smoothly. And, uh, and you're just all harmonious and, and everything is just swell, right? And then there are other times when uh, it looks a little more like this, probably, right? Uh, when you're communicating in families. But uh, one thing that's sure is that families are some of the most enduring relationships that we have. So spending a few minutes focusing on how we communicate in families is a worthwhile discussion for us. So let's just do that um, here for a few minutes and talk about how we can communicate in families more effectively and, and how we can enhance our relationships by doing so. So to start off with, let's talk a little bit about what do we mean by family? What makes a family? Well, a family can be made up, and believe it or not, of, of a variety of different things and, and in a variety of different ways. So um, first, obviously, family can include people with whom you share genetic ties, people with whom you share DNA. So your parents, your siblings, your, your you know, blood relatives, cousins, grandparents, people like that. Obviously, that's your family um, and you don't get a choice in that. You're born into the family you're born into. Right. But so genetic ties certainly have a large impact on on determining our our not only our appearance, but our personality, our disposition, our attitudes toward different things. And and so a lot of this is passed down through DNA, even, you know, some of your health issues or or strengths of health uh, may come from these genetic genetic ties. So um, certainly genetic ties are an incredibly important part of what can make a family. But it's not the only thing. Families can also be created through um, what we would call legal obligations, right? So if you um, marry someone who has children, then legally you have a responsibility for those children. Or if you adopt a child, then you would have a legal obligation to that child, right? And to those people, when you marry someone in general, and there are more laws associated with marriage than any other relationship that you will have here in the United States. Uh, regarding the, the, the legality and the uh, of those relationships and what all goes along with it. So marriage in and of itself in, enhances that legal obligation of creating a family. So you can create a family through uh, those simple kind of, not simple, but those types of legal obligations will, will create a very strong family bond and, and uh, a very enduring one as well, uh, as you'd find out in the courts if it should ever dissolve or you should ever violate those obligations. But we can also create family just through role behaviors. In other words, people we treat like family become family to us. Even if we technically have no genetic ties to that person, no legal obligations, if we decide to treat someone as though they are a part of our family, then really, um, relationally, they become a part of our family and we start to, to communicate with them differently than we might just an acquaintance or even a friend. When we when we see that person as family, they take on a different role for us. So just our role behaviors in how we treat other people and how we determine that we're going to treat other people if we're going to consider them part of our family can really establish them as part of a family. So you can see families made up in a variety of different ways. And, and so these things would affect all of these. And those each each one is different, but uh, but each of them also falls under that umbrella of family. So what does communication have to do with any of this? How do we use communication to create family? Well, we do that in a variety of different ways. We use communication to create and then maintain and enhance family. One of those is through family stories. Humans are narrative creatures. We love stories, you know, historically, before the written word, we passed everything down through story and through um, just verbal spoken word, right? So we, we are narrative creatures. We love stories. We love hearing stories about uh, our family. Um, I love hearing stories about when my parents were younger and the different kind of hijinks they got up to and, and their siblings and their families and what life was like for them. That's why we talk to people about uh, you know, that are elderly about what life was like during their time and what did they experience? How is it different now than it was then? How is it different for us? We create this uh, this narrative about our family through these stories. And and so, of course, then we could talk about the, the importance of gatekeepers and gatekeeping and what stories get told and which ones get left out and how does that shape our view of our family? But um, those types of things are all important in determining how we identify with our family, what we identify with our family. And, uh, and so family stories are a way that we use creation or we use communication to really create family and to feel that sense of belonging um, with other people and that connection with other people. We also do this through family roles. You know, if you have siblings, if you have multiple siblings in particular, you know that you kind of fall into these different roles, right? 
Um, so my oldest sister, for example, is the is the responsible one. She's the one always holding the leash, right? She was the one who was responsible for making sure that we all stayed safe and made good decisions. Even though she wasn't our parent, she was the one who was always concerned with those types of things. And still is. She's still the responsible one in our family. Right? And I have another brother who's the one with the temper. And another brother who's the laid back one. And I'm, I'm the slacker of the family. That's my role in the family. When you hear stories about me and our family talking about stories, it's going to be about how I was slacking off. And especially when I was younger and, and I maybe didn't uphold everything that I should be doing. That I was always trying to get out of stuff. And so I'm the family slacker. And those maintain throughout our lifetimes. I certainly don't think I'm the slacker anymore. My brother, who was the one with the temper, has learned to control his temper as he's gotten into adulthood, of course. And and so we, we continue on with these roles in some ways because we're expected to. And in other ways, we work out of these roles, but never really within our family because we are constantly communicating about how we fit into these roles and, you know, we could get into confirmation bias of, well, that's what they expect from me. So that's how I'm going to behave or that's all they see because that's what they expect of me. But these family roles play a powerful part of these family connections and they are established and maintained through communication. We also use family rituals. Uh, different families have different rituals. And sometimes these are huge rituals like at Christmas, for example, my family always at Christmas time, we read the Christmas story out of the Bible before we open gifts. And then when we open gifts, it's always the youngest to the oldest, and you open one at a time, and you take your turn and so forth. Other families just tear into stuff, right? That's their ritual. They wake up first thing in the morning. Everybody tears into everything, just opens it all up. Those are different rituals that we have on different holidays and things like that. But we also have smaller rituals. Maybe you, your family has a, a family game night or a family movie night where you're all together. And, and you know that that's kind of sacred and you don't schedule anything for that night because that's movie night or whatever. And, and or my friends and I used to call it QFT, quality family time. You want to do this tonight? No, I've got QFT. And we all knew, oh, yep, okay, I understand. You got some quality family time. You got you to gotta put in your time there with your family. So sometimes it's more just on a regular basis like that. Other times it's just regular stuff you do. Um, do you have a regular parking spot? You know, do you know that, you know, mom and dad are going to park in the driveway or the garage? And if kids have cars, they're going to park on the street or wherever they can find a space. Those are not reserved for them. Um, you know, parents take priority in getting those types of things. Or uh, my family also, when we get together, we like to sing. So before we eat and we're all together, we will oftentimes sing a song, which can be a little different if you're not used to that. <laughs> and you come to one of our family meals, you're going to get to either sing along or at least hear a song probably that we're going to sing before we start to eat. So every family has different rituals um, that they that they do. And that, that kind of those are communicated, you know, either expressly or, or in an unspoken way. And you just kind of get to know them as you get to know this family and become part of this family. But we create those through communication then. Every family also has secrets. Uh, and again, sometimes these are huge secrets. Sometimes it's, you know, I, I don't know. Sometimes it's, you know, well, so-and-so's family member was in prison or, or, you know, stole a bunch of money or did something awful. That's a big family secret, right? But other times it's just smaller things that, that families keep closer to their vest. Like, you know, if, if a family's having money issues just temporarily, they may not want everybody to know that. So it's a secret within the family or if somebody's ill and they don't want that getting around, then that may just be a family secret, something they keep to themselves, right? So um, we create our family with communication by connecting with those bonds as well and keeping those things um, secret to a certain extent. Uh, so we create family through all types of communication and in a variety of ways that, that this is, again, significant. It's different than our other relationships. And, and it's what partly what creates family and it's partly how communication then uh, plays into creating family. So what can we do to create effective family communication? That should be our goal. Of course, family, again, is some of the most enduring relationships that we're going to have. So creating effective communication within the family should be a priority for us. The first thing we can do is manage that connection autonomy dialectic. We talked in a previous video about, you know, relational formation and some of the things surrounding that. And one of those concepts was um, dialectical tension. Right. And one of those tensions was connection autonomy, this idea that we'd like to be connected. We want to be known and to know others. We want to be connected. We want to be with others. But at the same time, we have this desire for independence. And those are going to, it's like a pendulum. It swings back and forth how strongly we're going to feel those things. And it also depends on the individual and on personality and so forth. And then again, remember that everybody else is feeling that same dialectic. So you may be feeling connection, but they may be feeling autonomy and so forth. Those things require management, especially in a family where you have these expectations for connection, oftentimes, right? And especially if you're living in the same home, 
that you're going to be around people all the time. You have to really actively manage that connection autonomy dialectic, this, this balance between um, independence and connection and the expectations and what they are in that particular family and for that particular individual. So we have to be very clear and very active in managing that and understanding that dialectic. Sort of similarly, we have to strive for closeness while respecting boundaries. This is sort of related in some ways, but um, we need to, to really try to be close with our family. Again, these are people we're going to have relationships with for a long, long time, oftentimes in close quarters, especially if you're living with these people still. So, you know, closeness is just a byproduct of that. So we ought to strive for that closeness and work as we can to create that closeness. But at the same time, we have to respect that every person is individual. Every person desires to some extent to be autonomous and to have that kind of freedom. So we have to respect their boundaries and establish what those boundaries are and be uh, appropriate within um, that context as well. Then finally, we want to really encourage confirming messages. Confirming messages are the opposite of disconfirming messages. And uh, so disconfirming messages convey a lack of value where confirming messages convey value. They convey to the other person that they have value and that you value them. And, and so they're essentially positive messages. We really need to encourage those. And again, be mindful and intentional about uh, establishing and encouraging and sharing these confirming messages. Now, does that mean we can never say anything negative to that person? We can't ever correct them or discipline them or, or share a, a contrary thought? No, no, no. That's not at all what we're talking about. But we have to be aware of balancing that out with the sense of, you know, I value you. And I'm going to, even when I'm expressing those types of things, I'm going to do so in a way that expresses that value that I'm doing this because I care about you and because I'm trying to do this for your benefit, because I want what's best for you. It's, we need to encourage confirming messages of value. And it doesn't even have to be wrapped up along with those negative messages. Sometimes we just need to tell people straight out, I value you. You are worth something to me. I love you. I care for you. You have value to me and you bring a lot to this family. That can be tremendously powerful um, when we hear those things out loud and we, we have those encouraging, confirming messages, especially again, when we're in such close contact with these people for such an extended period of time, it's really, uh, really behooves us to be intentional about uh, sharing that kind of uh, confirming message. So again, family is, is, you know, friends, as we've talked about in a previous video, will come and go. Coworkers will probably come and go as you change jobs. Um, romantic relationships could turn into family, right? But family is an enduring relationship. And whether you love your family, whether you really try not to be around them very much, they're still your family. You're still connected to them in this very real way. So, uh, so learning to effectively communicate with them has a number of benefits. If you have questions about communication in families or any other type of relational communication, please feel free to email me. I'd be happy to chat with you about that. And in the meantime, I do hope that you will examine your family relationships, really focus on those confirming messages and, and respecting boundaries, but also striving for that closeness and just creating the most enduring bonds that you can with these, uh, these so, so, so important people in your life.